So I'd already introduced myself. My name is Jeremy Jones. Um, I'm a professional snowboarder by profession the last 25, 30 years or something. And then in 2017, which is the pivot point that I'm going to kind of hone in on today in my life, um, where my snowboarding career changed uh, and many other things. But let's the title behind me, what doesn't kill you doesn't kill you. I think, um, you know, I moved through this and in the end I'm going to kind of, you'll understand this statement if you don't already, but Kelsey just explained it so well and so in, in her story, and I just thought it was really cool, I was taking notes on Sugar Packet, but <laughs> the, uh, you know, again, to the passion, like she's, you can clearly see it. That's what's driving her to do this, to keep going. And, and she mentioned her choice to do that, right? Like, the reason I came up with this title is because what doesn't kill you makes you stronger made me so furious. Because I didn't, I didn't understand it when I was laying, you know, on the ground, which you'll come to find out, un and I can't move, and... I'm like, I'm not stronger, but I'm not dead. So I don't really understand this kind of, this saying. And I just started breaking it down. It was one of the things that I kind of spent a lot of time doing. And that's really what led me to kind of stand here in front of you. But the, I created this, this presentation. Um, right now I'm going to show you what it is I do in snowboarding. I focus in video. I would film a video part every season, one a year, and my entire year was formed around getting three second shots as often as possible on different features and things, and then compiling at the end for about a three minute segment. And that was what I would build up every single year for 12 months um, snowboarding. And that was, it was, a crazy process. I did that for 25 years. And this video will just intro that, so we'll get started on that. It'll help you kind of understand, give you a visual.
So that'll help kind of fill in all the questions as I talk when you're, when I'm referring to snowboarding, you can kind of just think of features or the rails and the big snowmans build to the walls or in the back country, we build wedges, you know, the little kickers or we're going off the cliffs and the rocks. So what you're seeing here on the screen is the, uh, those are my junior high notes that uh, the principal and my teachers were sending home. And they talk about how I just was a problem. I wasn't listening much, put my fingers in the ears, nah, what, what teacher? And they're, you know, they're not that stoked about it. Discipline problems, um, what else? Yeah, fingers in ears, that's my favorite one. I don't recall, but it's, I don't, I'm not gonna call him a liar either. So, with this, you know, I, I was just focused. Like, I wanted, I'd learned about snowboarding. I was watching snowboarding videos in the basement of my house, not doing homework. That's what I should have been doing. And eventually, mom kind of picks up on it. Um, you know, the notes are coming home. Homework's not getting done. Snowboarding is, I'm getting good at that and getting better, understanding I know more. She still knows nothing, just watching a lot of videos. So I get put in front of me a challenge. So this is when I was 18, my business plan about what I was gonna, how I was gonna be a pro snowboarder. So now my dad's kinda on me as well. And this is not, at the time, a career that you really get to chase down. We're not in the Olympics yet. Um, Videos were just starting to happen. Contests were hand dug, you know, grassroots events that just little local shops would throw or the local like homie crew, basically. So I've made something up. He's like, I need to see some sort of proof that you have a plan. How do I do that? Well, write me a business plan. All right, I know how to write, kind of. So I started writing. Most of it spelled wrong. But I made it up and just was like, I'm going to make a little bit of money. I'm going to meet filmers. I'm going to meet photographers. And they're going to like pull me in. They're going to take photos of me because I'm rad. And it's going to look good. And we're all going to make money. And my dad bought it. And he decided that he would give me $200 a month for gas money for that following winter. But I only had that winter to pull it off. I didn't even know what I was doing still. <laughs> I just wanted to snowboard. But I had a credit card with 200 bucks on it for gas, so me and the homies were making sure we were doing that. Halfway through that season, I got kind of noticed and an opportunity to go to Chile on a snowboard trip with the company. They were gonna pay for my way but I had to front the money for the ticket, and that's what this is, is, you know, it's, as much as my parents were not backing me, they backed my effort. And, sorry, has, parents are good, they help us out. So she hooked me up with 750 bucks, that's the check. I think it's pretty sick. It says Argentina on there. I don't think I ever paid her back. The intention for sure was to do that. Definitely didn't. This is my career in 27 years. I don't know how else to really explain it. The video you watched, that was my focus. I would just put everything into that. And it was very much just one lane for me. That's what I thought about. I wasn't in a space to learn other things or be a better person. I was just going to be a better snowboarder than I was the year before. It wasn't even to be the best or to stand out or make any sort of mark other than show my own self up year after year. That's all it was. And I did that through videos and video and magazines and this is what I ended up doing for way too long. I was on video games, and then this is kind of how we got into it, and I'll move through these, these a little bit quick, but we had 
what we called a spot. And me and my friends would go up there in the trees, in the elements all day. I know you all are familiar with weather. I think that's one thing we can probably all relate with, right? Like we don't, um, we don't get to pick our good days when it comes to weather, right? Like Mother Nature picks those for us. I know your crops feel it, and I'm definitely ignorant to, to this industry, so excuse me for that, for my you know, ignorant explanations of, in comparison, but you know, that I'm sure, I mean, I've, I've read stories, like a bad season is not just a bad season, like it's maybe not recoverable, right? And a lot of times, maybe not recoverable for two seasons to follow, three seasons to follow. I don't know, nod heads. Say no, yes, where are we at? See? Yeah, I feel it, yeah. So the spot provided us a training facility. It was kind of the first in snowboarding to do it, and we just did it because we just needed to get thick skin, essentially. So as soon as snow would fall, we would start going up into the trees. This is kind of my um, group, the bosses, we would call ourselves, spot bosses. And this is the spot. We had a little zone. It was really gladed. We'd clean it out every summer. We had nothing on the ground. I mean, it was just real clean, six inches of snow, and we were snowboarding and hiking up in dirt. It was a mile hike in to snowboard there all day. We called it the cooler at times because it was always freezing. But this is where we honed our skills pre-season so that when we hit the streets, we'd say in that video you saw, and we needed to break the ice by getting our first clip for the season. This was super helpful in providing us that, that kind of, I guess, feet under us. And you can see that's what we're hiking up in. That's just dirt early spring, that's probably November, or right about now, actually, a few years ago. So the spot provided that for us. Now, where are we on on time, Kelsey? All right, just keep going. You guys got a one minute video in you? You like the videos? Okay, so this video is an early contest video. This is, this is how I entered contests. And it was a first of its kind video contest that X Games put on. It's called Real Street. What they did to us is they said, we got invited in the front of November and we were asked to deliver a one and a half minute video part by January 1st. So the streets, the cities tend to get a couple snowfalls before the new year, most of the time, in Salt Lake anyway, and Minnesota, which is a favorite spot of mine, Twin Cities. And who's from Minnesota, anyone? Ooh, second home if I'm, you know, have place for ips. Good rails too, cool cops. And <laughs> the, uh, anyway, the, the spot aided to this. So when this opportunity came to us, it came to all three of us that you saw in that lift chair, and we're like, yeah, we'll do that, because we, we're primed. We, we can deliver the footage. We just need six inches of snow in the city, any city. And we'll go there, and we're ready to roll. And so that's what this edit is, and I'll show you that. This was my submission the last year I did it. I did it three years.
you. So that's essentially a product of that preseason and just putting in that extra effort. And that was, you know, the kids are on that now. They're snowboarding, you know, the second that that snow hits. And it, it's cool to see that energy. It was gone in snowboarding for a little bit. But so now let's, let's fast forward. I'm going to, like, 2014, I, w I l was let go from a sponsor. This is my, I kind of had all eggs in that basket, so to speak. And I lost that in 2014 going into the season. So I had a rough couple seasons. Um, and in 2016, guess what I was doing, Kelsey? I was trying to figure out how to do this again because I was 40 years old and just got let go from a 12-year sponsor. I have 27 video parts that, you know, kind of define my career, I guess, and then it's the only thing I know how to do. I'm, I'm backed into a corner because I rode this thing for so long and I was just so focused. And I, I, w I was stuck. And in that kind of phase, I ended up starting a brand with a, with a friend. Um, we made helmets, actually, and they still do. Uh, and we were decided to go on a little cat trip. So that's what this is, a cat driving through the snow. We get fresh powder, um, snow that no, one's el no one else has touched. This cat is similar to if you were to take a snowmobile out into the backcountry. This is privately owned. This is not an operation. And so we're, we are responsible for what's happening to our crew. This isn't normal, or this was not abnormal for us, something I was very used to. I'd been doing it for years. And same with a lot of the people on this crew. Some of them hadn't, and they were new to it, but we knew that as well. This snow was some of the best that I had ever ridden. I believe this is a movie that I thought I took out, but we're going to show it. You got that sound on there, Jenny? Is our sound working? I'll kind of talk over this a little bit, but this was the snow from that day. And if you know Utah snow, I won't get too into it if you've never touched snow or are familiar with Utah snow, but 30 years of this is and traveling the world, best snow I've ever experienced to this date was this day. It packing on my face right there, I can feel it now and it actually makes me almost choke because it was making me choke. It was incredible. I was one run away from trying something I'd never tried on a snowboard because the snow consistency, and you've seen jet skis, you know when they jump and then they'll actually dive. Anyone do that? No one does it. Has someone in, have you done it? Gone under the water? How dope does that feel? Is that amazing? Well, yeah, I've always wanted to do that on a snowboard. This was feeling like that day. And I was looking into that for um, my next run. And we kind of cooked through the day and ran it towards the end to our point of one final run. We'd only done three runs that day because of how deep the snow was and how hard it was coming down. The consistency of the base in the mountains that season was perfect up until that day. And that morning, the snow started falling so hard and so fast and with so much moisture, it completely changed about seven feet of, like, I don't know, what would you call it, a single, like, perfectly consistent snow from the top to the dirt. And so when we dug our pit, that was our reading we get. We'll usually dig a pit. You saw it in that, um, the cat road, like we were cutting that lane. It looks a lot like that. And we'll do different, you know, pat tests, cut tests, to kind of find the layers of the different storms. And, you know, sometimes you'll get a weak layer that's just gonna collapse the first layer that layer is going to rip like it's on glass, essentially. So that's kind of what we had 
working with us. We were testing everything. We had gone down this particular run, the run before. And as I said before, I really wanted to jet ski. So I was going to try to do this. So this to the left here. Does it have a pointer? The red one. Sick. So you see this? Those are our tracks from the first run. We took right next to the trees. Snow's anchored better to the trees. And that's a way of kind of testing it after you've done the, the, the pit. You can stay in close and see if you're feeling any instability. Or if it pops, you're right there at the trees because that's going to, anything breaking is going to be disrupted by a tree trunk or anything really that's in its path. So we staged a photographer here, photographer here, because we wanted to go, red button, there's a cliff right here out of, this, out of the frame that we wanted to hit and we were going to land here. So my friend was going to go first. His name's Alex. It actually is his real name. He's given me permission to use it. And he, he's a little frother, so he's like hyped. He wants to get in there. He jumps off of the rock. He cuts across that blue line and dips in by the photographer. The pho photographer is placed by that tree, as I said, because it will break a fracture line. So we're trying to place her as safe as possible if anything happens. So. I get queued up, I get a three, two, one. This is my line. So three, two, one, I drop. I land right next to Alex's landing and the snow kind of eats me up and I do a forward somersault right back to my feet and I'm tracking across the bowl towards the photographer. And right there where the little lightning bolt is, I just hear again, we're all familiar with weather, and we know very well what it sounds like when thunder just smacks over the house, right? Like your house shakes, wakes you up in the middle of the night, and you sit up. It's that kind of a crack. That's what I hear, and I know I'm in trouble. It's familiar at an intensity that I've never, hadn't yet experienced, and so I knew right away things were different than anything I had done. I, let's go back actually. This is cool part. Actually the most defeating part, but pretty cool story. So I do that as I followed that line, it goes through that pine tree. So that was the craziest part. I saw, I like, was in the slide and I'm still on top of the snow and it's just immediately rushing you down. And I was just as quick as that pop ha happened, I was noticed I was under that branch. So I reach up with both hands and I squeeze that branch and you can kind of see the, uh, you know, this is the day after. So it did snow a little, but the branches were so clean. Some other photos and I had, <laughs> Oh, grab that branch. And I, in my soul, was smiling because I, I had, like, stomped this avalanche. There was no way I was going down the rest of the hill because I had a hold of this tree. And as soon as I grabbed that and just squoze as tight as I could, my, I just feel my hands start, like, popping over the branches that are flared off of the main branch. And I'm, it's just like that, <laughs> I don't, cartoon, you know, and you're just like, no, really? Really, am I losing this? And sure enough, I lost it. And I go over this cliff that's in the right corner. As I go over that cliff, the snow comes over me and everything goes black and then I hit a tree. So this is a secondary fracture. So. When I went over the cliff, this avalanche just compounded and doubled up in size on me. And then right, you can see the little aspen here. So we have a trunk kind of down in here. And that's where I hit right between my feet on my snowboard. And 
ultimately shattered both of my legs, which I was unaware of at the time, but as quick as I hit the tree, I smashed my face on it, kind of fell back, was knocked out, definitely got a head injury that I didn't pay attention to. And I was, you know, KO'd and awake by the time my butt was hitting the snow. And then I'm just staring at a tree trunk that is up to my crotch and I'm buried. And just as quick, my buddy Brock Harris was right next to me. And he was, is one of those ones on the lift and who's ran those early season kind of trainings with us. And as soon as I saw his face, I was super comfortable because I knew I was at least out of there, even if it was, you know, body only. But it was, I was getting out because I knew he was there. And we started that process, discovered the legs were broken. We had about half a mile of avalanche debris to work through so we could get down to the cat road and about 45 minutes of light left. So we make, this is a makeshift one that is me. I did this in training afterwards on the right. I showed this to a different avalanche group because we created this scenario with the equipment we had. This is me in the cat after we had done that. I have duct tape around the boots to keep my legs together because I had a small attachment in, in one leg. So both bones, all four bones broke, tib fib. The um, fib in the left was connected still, so that leg still kind of wasn't Gumby based. But if I duct taped my right leg to my left, I could kind of swing both legs around and, and try and help out Brock because I'm 180 pounds and a half, of a half a mile of avalanche debris is like rocks and not that rad for someone slightly out of shape and doesn't snowboard as much as they used to and now, you know, 10 years into an office job. But his brain was very much connected to 10 years past and his body responded to that at least for that moment. He was for sure paid the next day. But that moment of um, him helping me was something that I wouldn't, I mean, I certainly wouldn't trade that experience for anything, but I, I would, just trying to decide if I really want to say this again. Uh, I've, said, I've said it a few times, I, I still believe it. I would do this again and go through just the same thing, just to see him kind of pull that off again, pull off saving me and checking those boxes that we had spent so many years preparing for, but we'd never really been in that situation to this intensity. And that was like, it was just unreal. I mean, one of the most beautiful sequences I could imagine. So this is now the cat. The lifelight got to me. They packed me to the hospital. They do x-rays, and we come out with that. So tib fibs are shattered. Um, but to me, they looked fine, kind of. I was like, yeah, I mean, you guys know how to do your thing. Like, just st staple them up. Tell me when I'm good, you know? And they're like, <laughs> the PA, PA wasn't that hyped. He's like, oh, yeah, what do you do again? I'm a snowboarder. Well. You won't be doing that anymore. And I was like, I'll show you video in three months. That was my response. Now, this is where passion and pride back you into a corner that maybe you shouldn't go. But I will say, you should still probably follow it. 14 weeks later, I missed it by two weeks. Um, my wife, who just walked in the door, thanks for showing up, love. 
was gone. My kids were at school, and I'm like, Brighton just closed two weeks ago. I thought I missed this opportunity to really show the PA, you know, what I told that I was going to follow through with what I said. He'll never see it. He'll never know. It's just me, right? Family's gone. I hike up to Brighton. It's closed. They just got two feet of snow. I park at the bottom of Millicent, which is a lift right there at the parking lot. And I started to try to walk up the hill to meet some friends that I knew were shooting photos up high. And I'm about 50 steps in, and I'm already on my hands and my knees crawling because it hurts so bad. So I hiked to the top of the hill that was maybe, I don't know, just trying to find some pitch to get back to the car, really. But it's a quarter mile from the car. And that's what that was, just that little ride. And that was really just for a soul. Like, can I be a human again? Can I, like, do what I want to do? So I showed him what was up, you know? <laughs> he still doesn't know. I don't even know his name. And it doesn't matter, and I'm not even mad about it. But I like those challenges, you know, that I chose um, as Kelsey spoke, you know, it's my choice whether I'm dead or whether I'm not. Because I'm breathing, I'm not standing very well, I'm not walking, I'm not doing the things I want, but who's to say I can't? I mean, someone says I can't, sort of means that's sort of the reason why you can, right? And to understand what you all have in front of you, it's a little hard, but I can, what I'm seeing is financially, we're looking down the barrel of not some pretty rad, not a really, I don't know, some pretty whack months coming up maybe, right? That can maybe be scary. Um, I just started a business back in snowboarding. I'm relaunching a snowboard brand that I was a part of 20 years ago. And I'm realizing I'm launching a brand in a recession, which is so smart. <laughs> and, but again, I'm all in, and this is what I want to do. You know, I, I represent a smaller part of snowboarding, the core part of snowboarding. From what it sounds like, when I draw the comparisons, that's the group that's here. It's a, a core part of this industry where you're taking risks on new products and those are financial risks. You're depending on weather. You're depending on things that are out of your control. And to find strategy in that is very difficult. And to me, it only, you can only do that with passion. Otherwise, you're just going to dip. Because if I can just shut it off at 5 o'clock and be done with it, I mean, that works for a lot of people. And it doesn't work for me because I, if I can turn it off, I kind of don't really want to be a part of it. And I just want to be invested. So strong roots, again, like that's what's going to like yield our crops, right? Our strong roots and the things that kind of nail them down. And the things that are going to bring us back and keep us fighting for, you know, two years of being paying for an off season. So there's always a way back. You find the people that help you. These are mine, the last few slides. That first slide is my family. These are two of my good friends that just would come to take me out for a walk or push me around in a chair and, again, make me feel human. So I created this, what doesn't kill you doesn't kill you, as rehab. 
I just needed space to tell a story. I needed to live in my trauma, as Kelsey spoke about. Um, and it's not just all I know anymore. It's just all I want to do. So I'm just going to know everything I need to know. But good luck. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. I know we ran long. Um, what doesn't kill you doesn't kill you. It's up to you if you're stronger.